Kelly Lundy Rothwell, a 35-year-old woman from Indian Rock Beach, Florida, was a police cadet who was just a few weeks from graduation. On March 12, 2011, she told a friend she was going home to break up with her boyfriend. Kelly was never seen again. I'm Ed Densel, and this is Unfound. first image that pops into your head when you hear me say the word evil? I don't mean a subjective kind of evil like maybe your mother-in-law who you don't get along with during the holidays or that boss that won't let you out of work early because you need to go see your daughter's soccer game. I'm thinking of something, an idea of evil that's much more objective one in which everything that it touches turns dark, turns bad. Every person who comes in contact with that evil one lives to regret it. I'm sure some of you might think of Hitler. Or maybe in the 21st century, within the last five years, you might think of the terrorist group ISIS. Maybe even some of you might even think of the not-so-real, like Freddy Krueger or Jason from the Friday the 13th films. Others, you maybe try to split the difference. Maybe the first image that you think of is the devil, of course, depending on your theological background. But do we really accept that evil exists in our everyday lives. When you're sitting in your car at that stoplight, do you realize that the person in the car next to you could be one of those evil types? Because I'm here to tell you that those human beings exist. Regular human beings, not famous or infamous, as you might say. But people who go throughout their lives and seeming every person that comes in contact with them hates it. You're going to be hearing a little bit about that today. See, I'm inclined to believe that too many human beings think that there's some kind of goodness in every person. No matter how much evil that person brings into the world, there's some little morsel in there. Maybe they're nice to puppies, or they give to some charity organization, even though otherwise they just torment everyone. I can tell you I'm not so sure. And in fact, once again, after hearing this episode, you may come closer to my side of the argument. In contrast, you're going to hear about a person who hasn't been intimidated by evil the last five years. A woman who has been threatened. She's been impersonated online. Her email has been hacked. Her website has been hacked. All during the course of trying to bring an evil man to justice. And the pursuit of that justice for this woman continues until this very day because of a pledge she gave to Kelly Rothwell's mother just days after Kelly disappeared. I'm calling this episode Kelly Rothwell in Pursuit of Evil. These are the facts of the case. This is a condensed version of what you might find at The Charlie Project. On March 21st, 2011, Kelly had lunch at a Chili's restaurant in Clearwater, Florida with a close friend of hers, Donna Sherritt. Kelly told Donna that she was planning to go back to her condo in Indian Rocks Beach after they were done 
and tell her boyfriend of three years, David Perry, that their relationship was over. Those three years had been marked by abuse, arguments, controlling and suspicious behavior by David that led Kelly to believe he was involved in illegal activity, something that could put her police career in jeopardy. Kelly left the restaurant and returned home. The sound of her car pulling in noted by the neighbors, although she was never seen. Not long after, those same neighbors downstairs heard thudding above them on the floor of Kelly's condo, their ceiling. This was followed by the sound of vacuuming. The day after, Kelly's car was found on a nearby causeway spanning from Indian Rocks Beach over to the mainland, no more than a mile from her condo. Around the same time that her car was found, her boyfriend David arrived back in his hometown, Elmira, New York, seemingly having driven nonstop from Florida. After that lunch with her friend, Donna, Kelly was never seen again. Anybody with any information regarding the disappearance of Kelly Rothwell should contact the Pinellas County Sheriff's Office at 727-582-6333. You should know that this case is a bit personal to me. I live about four miles from where Kelly used to live and about three miles from where her car was eventually found. In addition, I crossed that causeway where a car was found at least a few times a week. And I can tell you, now that I've found out about this case, every time I go over that bridge, it's always running through my mind. However, I hadn't moved here till later in 2011. I moved to the Madeira Beach area in October of 2011, whereas this disappearance took place in March of that year. However, somebody who did live here at the time the disappearance took place and took an automatic interest in it was Lee Clifton, owner and content provider at TampaBayCrimeReport.com. She has been a writer slash photographer for over 25 years and has worked for the Wilmington News Journal in Delaware, the Washington Post, the Old Town Crier in Alexandria, Virginia, the Gabber Newspaper in Gulfport, Florida. She's also worked for Beach Life Magazine, the Beacon Leader B Newspapers, as well as Patch.com and Examiner.com. And probably most importantly, Nancy Grace covered Kelly Rothwell's story a few years ago. On that show, Nancy portrayed it as though she and her people on their own collected all of this information regarding Kelly Rothwell and her boyfriend, David Perry, when in fact they were using all of the information that Lee Clifton had collected. But Nancy Grace and her people never once gave Lee Clifton the credit. Well, she's going to get plenty of credit on this show. and In fact, right now, you're going to hear my interview with Lee Clifton. I am so fortunate to be able to have on the phone uh, with me Lee Clifton. She is from the Tampa Bay Crime Report, and she has been covering the disappearance of Kelly Rothwell since it happened. Lee, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Ed, for having me. I really appreciate it. Why don't you first give the listeners an idea about who you are, you know, your experience, your background? Well, I was in the restaurant business for a long time, but concurrent with that, I was a freelance journalist. And I grew up in Wilmington, Delaware, but I lived in Washington, D.C., and I freelanced for the Washington Post as a photographer. I worked for a small newspaper in Alexandria. And, again, concurrent with that, was in the restaurant business. And then I moved to Florida in 1997 and stayed in the restaurant business, but then picked up small freelance jobs as a photographer and a writer. I spent five years with a local newspaper and um, then started doing things on my own. And then Patch came along. And Patch.com was owned by AOL. 
and hmm. they were looking for online writers, and it sounded like something I wanted to do. I had been injured in the restaurant business and could no longer be, be in the restaurant business. I was a bar manager and a bartender and could no, no longer do it. I had an injured left hand. So I thought that'd be interesting. I sent them some samples, and they called me probably within two or three days and started putting me on news stories. Mm-hmm. And how does how does that work? Did they, so stories would pop up? They'd email you or call you and say, "Hey, can you can you work some work, write something on yeah. that?" Okay. Yeah, like yes, like we had the story of David Crawford, who was the Saint uh, Pete policeman who was murdered, and I happened to catch that because I was available, and I was on that story until the from the beginning when he was at the hospital, and unfortunately when he passed, and then all the way up to the funeral. And the final, and I did stories, I did photographs, I did a full picture page, I did interviews with people that knew him, and followed all the press conferences, and, wow. and then we ran a story in patch. It was several, we did several, I did several articles for them on that particular case. Mm-hmm. And then Linda Hersey, who was then my editor at Patch, um, very experienced editor, very, very good person, called me on the 15th and said, are you available? Uh, there's a case of someone gone missing in Indian Rock Beach. And this and would I be, said, okay. just to be specific, March 15th, 2011 is when you got this call. March 15th, 2011. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Yes. Great. Yes, because I had started working for Patch in December of 2010. And then this was, I was there about three months, three or four months before they stopped doing, stopped hiring freelancers. Okay. Anyway, Linda called me on Tuesday the 15th and said, do you have any time to maybe run this lead down? I've got a lead for you. And I said, okay. And remember, I, as, a, as a freelancer, I did a lot of features and I wrote sports and I was a photographer. So as a photojournalist, I usually do the story and the photographs. And that's what made me more attractive to potential employers because I could do it all. I could mm. edit. I could do everything and give them a complete package where especially an online package, which is, of course, where news has been going now for quite some time. So I said, sure, I'll do that. And um, she gave me the name, and she gave a woman, a young woman named Kelly Rockwell, and that she was a police cadet in the St. Petersburg Police Academy, and that she turned up missing and that her best friend had alerted the police, and she, her best friend, Donna Sherritt, had suspicions that there was something really bad, that something really bad had happened to her. Hmm. Okay. So, so that day, I um, that was a Tuesday, I took off, and I, I live in the Gulfport area, and I took off and decided to drive up to Indian Rock Beach, and they, I had had the address of Kelly's condo, and I just wanted to sort of drive around the area and just to get a feel, because I I don't know Indian Rock Beach very well. It's very north of me. Mm-hmm. And so I just kind of drove around and kind of see the area and what what was around there. And, and there was a Krabby Bills up the street. And um, I'm a Delaware girl. Mar- uh, Kelly was from Maryland. So, you know, we had a cra- the crabs. is always a big crab. Blue crimson crabs with, you know, mm-hmm. a, a big sort of common thing that most mm-hmm. of us on the East Coast are in- enjoy. Yeah. And I just felt that... Um, then I could, you know, get some information. So then I called John Dressback, who was the director at that time. He's since retired of the academy, and asked if he would have time to see me. And he said, I can't see you till Thursday. I said, okay, well, then I'll make an appointment for Thursday in the afternoon, which is what I did. And you had a prior relationship with him from this other story that you did covering? No. Okay. No, I didn't No, I didn't know John. John was part of the police academy. I okay. had known several of these officers that were, um, were uh, you know, employees of the police department that knew, had worked with David Crawford, who was the policeman who was murdered. Um, but I did not know John Dressback. Okay. And I did uh, call and introduce myself, and he agreed to meet me, which I was surprised about because they're usually quite reticent, and I was not going to look a gift horse in the mouth, so I said, fine, I will see you Thursday at 3 o'clock. Mm-hmm. So Wednesday I spent sort of doing some research, and... Again, I I am a very curious, I'm a very good researcher. I'm a very curious person. So research is, is 
like mana from heaven to me. I really enjoy it. Mm-hmm. And I like to get, I like the chase of it. I like to, the, the mystery of it. I like to be able to try to find answers. And that's just how I am. That's the way my personality is. And it's interesting to me as I look back, but I never really did a lot of news because it just, I was more of the person that wrote features that made you cry. If I made you cry, that was, I did my job. <laughs> okay. Features like a dog flying with cancer, mm-hmm. family, things like that. I was always very, I tried to evoke emotion with my, my writing. Yeah. So for me to do a hard news story was a bit different for me, but I was up to the challenge, and I I really I was really ready for it. I think. So you so on Thursday you met him. Well, before that, okay, I had this I had this feeling early Thursday mid morning. I was to meet him at three, and mid morning I had this something told me to go back to Kelly's condo. And I decided, I took my camera, because I had taken some photographs the first time I was there. I took my camera with me, and I decided to park a block away and just walk around, because I had not walked around. I had just driven by, stopped and taken some photographs from the road. This time, after understanding that they had a back entrance that faced the gulf, I wanted to see that entrance, because I kind of wanted to see where... They might have had an altercation or, you know, how another, it was another access point to her mm-hmm. condo because no one saw her leave. And as soon as I found that there was a second access point, which is the back stairs, I thought, you know, I'm going to go take a photograph of this. And that was part of my photography um, exhibit that I used for my, my story. Okay. So, so as I was walking around, I saw this car and it was backing up out of where Kelly's parking space would have been. And I stopped, I tapped on the window, and they stopped, and they rolled down the window. It was, it was a, a lady and a man. She was driving. Mm-hmm. And I said, hi, uh, my name is Lee Clifton, and I'm a freelance journalist. And I just knew it was her mother, because I just knew it. From the photographs wow. of Kelly, Kelly looked so much like her mother that I could see it in her face. I said, are you Mrs. Rothwell? And she said, yes. She was very upset. She was in tears. Yeah. and. Her, her bill that she was with, Mark, you know, leaned across the seat and said, we don't want to talk to any press. And I said, listen, Mrs. Rothwell, I'm going to tell you something. <laughs> this hmm. is the weirdest thing. I don't know how this happened. I don't know why, where it came from. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't have any idea. But I said, I said, no matter how long it takes me, I'm going to stay on Kelly's case. I said, I'll find out what happened to her. And I'm making you a promise right here and now that I will not stop until I bring Kelly home to you and your family. Wow. And I don't know, I honestly do not know where it came from. It gave me goosebumps. I, I get chills. Awesome. I get chills you telling me about this right now. Doing this interview, I get chills in it right now. That's amazing. Well, it was just, it just came out. And it was one of those things where, you know, when you're on, when you're on point on something and something is just, it just, the energy was there. And she turned to me and she said, I believe you. And thank you. Huh. And I think, and I think, because I respected her grief, that we really had a connection. And she, mm. I said, whenever you're ready to talk to me, I'll be happy to talk to you. But no pressure. I'm not going to call and bother you. Here's my card. And um, since then, we've met several times. Mm. And she's been to Florida, and we have become very close. We speak on the phone probably every two weeks. And I actually spoke to her earlier this evening. And uh, she was very grateful that you were covering Kelly's case, and she wanted me to tell you that. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Um, So what you're saying is if you'd have been just like 10 minutes later getting there, you would have missed her, and maybe this would have gone in maybe a little bit different direction. It was just – it was like a complete coincidence that you you didn't know she was going to be there. She didn't know you from anybody. Just right place, right time that this happened. And it was just so strange because I had, it just came into my head that I was going to go back there and check the, check the, the back door, which was the front door to the golf side. Mm-hmm. So they would come down the stairs. She was on the second floor. They would come down the back stairs, and that's where the cars were parked, under, they were under, you know, undercover. And then there was a little path that led right to the beach because she was literally just a, a half a block off the beach. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, it was very strange, and, I, and, I, and like I said, I don't know why I said what I said to her, but I made her a promise, and, and to this day, that's my promise to her family and to her, 
and I'm going to keep my promise. Wow. So. so tell me the first time that you heard the name David Perry. Well, I heard it that he was uh, the boyfriend mm -hmm. after I got the information that Donna shared there was a police report um, from the Pinellas County Sheriff's Office, and he was named, and I was able to get access to it because with media. And I thought, that's interesting, you know, and I thought, oh. And then <clears throat> I didn't know anything about him. Mm -hmm. I had never seen him, never heard of him. And her and mother, I, and just in that... Five, however long you it, conversation you had with her mother that that day, five days after Kelly disappeared, she didn't mention his name either. She didn't say, no. I, okay. All right, great. No. And she, okay. And she doesn't, well, she never mentions it. She never speaks his name. Okay. Oh. She never speaks his name either. Okay. It's, it's much too painful for her. She does not speak his name. Mm. But I didn't know who he was, so I set about doing what I knew how to do, which was just to start doing research. Um, mm. I found out where he was from, and I found out that he had been a corrections officer in Elmira Prison in Elmira, New York, where he grew up. Mm -hmm. And I just started re doing research, just Google, and I looked up people, and I was on Facebook, and I put out some Facebook feelers to people. You know, we had started a couple of different Kelly Rockwell pages on Facebook to sort of keep people updated. Um, and one is the one that I'm an administrative uh, admin on, uh, which is Ben Kelly Rothwell Home, as well as as is Lindsay and Lauren uh, Kelly's fraternal twin sisters. Mm -hmm. The three of us are um, admins on that page, and that's usually where I post my postings from my blog. I post my links there because most people will go there and read it. Now, so, did you... So what did you do first? Did you look into his relationship with Kelly? What did you find out about that? What I did was I, I texted or I called Nancy. And Nancy said, why don't you talk to Lauren and Lindsay? Because she really was not up to talking to anybody. Mm. Literally not, no one. She was very, she was really upset. And it just she didn't know what to do. And it was just something that was unfathomable that your daughter would be missing and you know, and everyone assumed that he killed her. And I didn't know that, but after I found out his, the way his character was, yeah. I had I had no, I didn't have any um, thought that he didn't do it. I, I thought he did it. Mm. I knew I knew he did it right away. That's that's how I felt. I felt mm. it in my gut that he did it right away. Right. So. Right. When, what I did was I started reaching out, and people started reaching out to me. And I was writing stories for Patch, and I decided to do a timeline of her whereabouts the day, the evening of, the day of her missing, of her disappearance, and the night before. And I had gotten some of this information from Donna. I had called Donna, told her who I was. Donna knew who I was because when I went to interview John Dressback, Donna was also at the police academy. She was also there, and so we met there, and I, we exchanged numbers, and I said, listen, I want to try to help you. And she was visibly upset, and she still is, because they were very good friends. So that's how I got information about him, and then Donna started giving me some information about how he was abusive, how he was volatile, how he she was going to leave him, that, you know, she was moving on with her life, and that... She, Kelly, was, Kelly was planning to move on for her life away from Dave, essentially break up with him break up with him yeah she was she mm. was to break up with him that day mm -hmm. that the day that she went missing which was the 12th okay that she went home ostensibly to speak with him had told him she was on her way home she had called him and said i'm on my way home we're going to talk and when i get home this is according to donna mm -hmm. and so she was ready to move on with her life. She got involved with the police academy. She had been in human resources before with a couple of different hotel chains. And she was really sort of feeling that she was getting her life together. And she wanted, it, coincidentally, to go into, um, to go into domestic violence. Mm -hmm. So I thought it was the concentration she was interested in. And I thought that was interesting. I didn't think anything of it because I didn't know anything about the whole background yet. Yeah, you didn't know about you didn't know about her relationship with David. 
You didn't find that out? No. Okay. I didn't. I knew that she had a relationship with him. I didn't know how volatile he was. I didn't know his stalking. I didn't know, you know, the, the amount of control he tried to exert. I didn't know any of that stuff until any of those that information until uh, afterwards. And then I kind of put everything together and realized that this is what probably happened, that he killed her. Mm-hmm. So... Um, when I spoke with Donna, and I got some information from her about Kelly, and she's the one that gave me a lot of really wonderful um, information about Kelly's character, how sweet she was, how kind she was. You know, she was very low-key. She was very mellow. She was always smiling. She was always very happy. And and that was where I got, I got to be able to, was able to make a sort of a characterization of, of Kelly that I could write about, you know, I would give me something to, to work with as far as describing who Kelly Rothwell was. Mm-hmm. And then when I spoke with her sisters and they all said the same thing that she had been, you know, very mellow. She was kind of a hippie. She loved, she had a, a Volkswagen named Putt Putt that she drove around and she put stick on flowers on. Huh. And she just was, yeah, she just was a free spirit. She designed jewelry. She liked to make pottery. She was just very of the earth. She but she was going to be a cop. Things. That's so, it's so, you know, it doesn't seem like the type of person that would do that, right? And I agree. And it was very, <laughs> it was very uh, kind of a big swing. Huh. But, you know, it, but I think with her, she was very, she was very grounded and very mindful. And I think that maybe that's why she wanted to go into law enforcement, because she felt she could make a difference. And, mm-hmm. and she was just that, she had a, a very empathetic Soul, and I think that's what would have stood her in wonderful stead had she been had she lived and been able to become involved with domestic violence issues. I think she would have probably done very well and been a really a great asset to any police department. Let's let's talk a little bit about Kelly and David's relationship because it's it's that which we believe eventually led to her disappearance. How did they meet? How long had they been going out before this happened? What was what were some of those? Is you've told me at least a couple stories about their relationship, but how did they meet? Give the listeners, uh, you know, an idea of this this volatile relationship that they had. Apparently, David was visiting Florida, uh, and he visited Florida quite a bit, according to sources that I have. Mm-hmm. And he was at a Sweet Tomatoes. And they met in line, and he sort of came on to her, charming and smiling, and um, she was sort of bowled over. He was, um, you know, tall. He was handsome. You know, he was about six two, dark hair, you know, well built. And I think he just sort of, you know, took her over and said, "Hi, you know, I, I want to talk to you. I want to let's have, let's mm-hmm. sit and talk." And I guess that's how it started. Um, and according to um, Donna, and then about three weeks later, he moved down to Florida and huh. moved in with her at the condo. Yeah. So just to be clear for the listeners, this condo that that Kelly disappeared from was hers, and she, he moved she in with her. He, right. She rented it. She rented she, it. She, okay. she was renting it. Okay. Correct. Okay. One one thing I do want to make sure I tell your listeners is that when he went back to Elmira. He turned to a woman he was dating and and some other friends and said, see you guys later. I met a rich bitch in Florida and I'm moving. Huh. That's what he said. That was a direct quote. Wow. So I have always thought that he planned all this, but I can't be for certain. I just Mm -hmm. have my own theories and that's why I have my blog. That's right. The Tampa Bay Crime Report, crime right? Report. Yeah. That's why it gives me an opportunity to make suppositions and some, and, and try to field out some questions and mm-hmm. things that you wouldn't normally be able to do in a regular publication. So. All right. So they begin this relationship, and it he starts showing these tendencies pretty quickly, but still, the, yes. but still, the, they went out for like about three years. They were there for the three, and it lasted, uh, Mrs. Rothwell says 2008 is when they started the date. Okay. And they were together three years, and it wasn't long before he was following her around. Apparently, he texted her all the time, um, and he was very, very OCD. 
to the point that, and I get this directly from people who have had visited her, from friends of hers from Colorado, because she lived in Colorado for a while, mm -hmm. prior to moving to Florida. And this is directly from sources from there that had visited her and had ex watched and ex seen his behavior, that he vacuumed six to seven times a day, that he wiped everything down, that all the counters were immaculate. There was nothing on them. One time, one of her friends was visiting and had a bottle of water, and she put it down the counter, and he grabbed it, literally grabbed it out of her hand and wiped the counter with a, with a rag and gave her the bottle back and said, just hold it. Oh, my. So, and she thought that was really odd. And she also, one of the observations she had was that Kelly was very quiet when she was there. And that wasn't like Kelly. Apparently, she was quite exuberant and fun and laughed a lot and smiled and was happy. And all of her friends had told me that they noticed a huge change once David moved in with her. Mm -hmm. Shortly thereafter, I think there was a honeymoon phase where typical abusers do yeah. everything they can to make you feel wanted and special. It's kind of like, then, it's like grooming, I guess, you, yep. something like that, yeah. yeah. Well, I think that it's, you know, it's like when they start ironing your clothes for you, then they start putting clothes out for you to wear, and then they start texting you and telling you how beautiful you are, and then they want to know what you're doing and who you've talked to and who are you texting, who are you emailing, what are you doing tomorrow, why aren't you here, blah, blah, blah. That's how it starts. Yeah. And I think that's what he started doing. He was getting very controlling. Um, interestingly, I also spoke to a source that is a beach bum. That's his self-profession. <laughs> um, we have the, some of those here. We have some of those here. A sure. professional beach bum, and he used to do kite sailing with Dave with Perry, and he said even he noticed that he was very controlling, and whenever he was, he would had, had dinner with them several times in their condo, and that David spoke the entire time, and Kelly literally said nothing, and he said, I thought that was really strange, because when I first met her, she was so bubbly. Mm. Those were his words. So mm. I think that with Kelly deciding that she wanted to go into law enforcement, that was her breaking out and trying to get free and ma making her own statement and having her own voice. Yeah, and, and it I should be that, it should be known that she was almost she was when she disappeared she was very close to graduating, very close. She was a month she was a month away from graduation. Wow. They were to graduate April 13th and they did in fact have graduation and they honored her when she was when with flowers and with a plaque. And they and they honored her um, during the ceremony. So, but wow. yeah, she was she was a month away from from graduating. And that the whole point of how she became missing when the, it was known that she was missing was one Donna tried to get a hold of her and she couldn't get a hold of her the next day. And then uh, one of the cadets called Donna and said, "Have you seen Kelly? She didn't show up." And she was they were supposed to have a little get together to celebrate, you know, the end of the the end of their um, run as, as the academy, and they were, you know, getting ready to graduate, and they had just had a few more things and performance um, requirements to fulfill, and then they were going to be graduating. And she didn't show up, and no one could find her, and no one, she wasn't answering her cell phone. So that was, there was all, there were all kinds of signs almost from the get-go mm -hmm. that something was terribly wrong. Donna received a text that day from Kelly's phone that had was full of misspellings and just, not the way Kelly would speak, and that triggered something to her as well. She knew right away she thought that was something was really wrong. Right. So, Tell the listeners about you interviewing the people who lived downstairs from Kelly and David. What did they have to say about the relationship? Yeah, and, David, and, David in, and David in particular. Excuse me. I went to talk to them as uh, Ken and uh, Mary uh, Williamson. Mm -hmm. And they lived downstairs from Kelly, and they were the ones that heard the noise. They heard a big thump. They heard Kelly come home. because You could hear when the car was parked in the back because they were downstairs. And I guess she went up the back stairs. And as soon as they heard the door shut, they heard a thump. And then a couple, two or three more thumps. Now, in the master bedroom, Kelly's master bedroom was over top of the Williams' master bedroom. Mm -hmm. And Ken happened to be either close by in the actual bedroom or just walking down the hallway toward it. 
I believe his wife was in the kitchen. And he said, Mary, come here. What do you hear? There was no yelling. There was no, there was no, there were no voices, just thumps. Like it was somebody was banging something on the floor, which would have been their ceiling. Yes. And he, you know, he wanted to go up. He said, I thought about it and thought about going up there to see if there was something wrong. But he had had several run-ins with David um, about HOA things. David had bought a grill that was too big and Ken complained about it to the homeowners association and they made him take it back. And it was, David was Mm -hmm. furious and he threatened his wife, Mary. Perry threatened uh, Mary uh, Williamson, you know, saying, you better watch your back. I'm watching you. I see what you do kind of thing. He was Mm. very threatening. So they were afraid of him, basically. Yeah. And he did not want to get involved. And I can't blame him, although he, to this day, still wishes he had at least gone upstairs. Yeah. I don't know if the outcome would have been any different because I just don't think it would have helped. So just to set this up again, Kelly and her friend Donna had lunch together. Kelly tells Donna, I'm going home. I'm going to break up with David. She goes home. The neighbors hear her car come in. They maybe hear her go up the steps, and then right after that, they hear this thud on their ceiling. The neighbors hear this thud on their ceiling, which would be the floor. Several, several yeah, thuds. Several, several, thuds. several thuds on their ceiling, which would be Kelly and David's floor. Correct. Okay. Okay. And then uh, that was followed by vacuuming. Mm. Like just massive vacuuming. And it, he vacuumed apparently for 15 to 20 minutes. And it was over the entire house, I guess, um, Ken heard. And then he didn't see anything else. Uh, they, you know, like I said, they were afraid of him. They kept to themselves. Yeah. They did, you know, hear the thumbs. They did think about trying to go and see if there was anything wrong. But were they an older they couple? Are they an older couple? Yes, Is they're it? an older couple. They're okay. tired, yes. Okay, okay. So... And I don't know that they even saw David leave. I don't know that anyone ever asked them if they had if they saw him leave that evening or not. Mm-hmm. But at some point he left. So I, I don't know. No one saw him leave. Not that we can find a witness of anybody that knew or saw him leave the condo. But he did leave because he wasn't there the next day when the police came over. Yeah, in fact, he drove the whole way back to New York. Yes, he did. He drove back to Elmira. That later that evening, Kelly got home around four thirty, quarter to five, I believe, mm-hmm. and it is surmised that he took off probably by seven or earlier wow. and was in Elmira because it's a twenty-two hour drive, I believe, and was in Elmira or maybe twenty-six hours, and he was in Elmira the next day and showed up at his house where his daughter was living. So roughly three after hours, roughly three hours after Kelly comes home to what her friend says was to break up with David. Three hours after that, David's packing everything in a car and going back to New York. Yes. Wow. And Kelly's body was never found, and no one knows. Mm. No, she was never mm-hmm. found. But it she should be noted, her car. Um, excuse me, but her car was found. Where was it found? Her car was found on the bridge going up over the intercoastal. I guess it was about a mile up the road, sort of halfway up the bridge, just parked. And it was by a hotel that she never registered in, or and no one ever saw her. Um, unfortunately, I don't think there was any bridge um, cameras, or we would have seen, you know, what happened. But someone did say they found a witness that said they saw him jogging back. From that area, he used to, apparently he used to jog quite a bit up in that area, but he was jogging back from that area where the car was found and came back to the condo. So once again, to put this into the timeline, possibly, Kelly comes home around 4.30, the thumps happen, the vacuuming happens, and if we're to believe it, at some point he might have taken her car over there and then jogged back. Yes. And it was all within that yes. three hours between her coming home and him driving back to New York. Yes. Wow. I think that it was a very calculated, um, on his part, it was a very calculated thing on his part, act on his part. I think that um, he knew what he was going to do because she had already called him and told him she was coming home and they needed to talk. 
Yeah. And Donna had been very worried, and Kelly said, don't worry, it'll be fine. It'll be a really good conversation. So I don't know if Kelly had any clue how volatile he was going to be. Mm -hmm. I, don't think, I don't think she had any idea uh, of what could potentially happen with him. She never, um, she never saw those, all of these things that went on in their relationship with the controlling and everything. She never, I guess, put it together that possibly he would harm her to the point where he might have killed her. Once again, nobody, he's still, he's, it should be noticed for the listeners, he's walking around a free man. But we haven't even gotten into half the stuff about David Perry yet. But he is walking around in Elmira, New York as we do this conversation. I need to state, yes, he is. state he's a that. Free man. State that for the record. <laughs> I had refused to speak to, to police, has refused to give a DNA sample, not that they need it because they had enough of it from the from the condo finally, mm -hmm. um, and had been, you know, telling everyone had gone to Hawaii and back, and he just, he's a free man now. The and police, the, the, the police did, though, did check out the apartment. They didn't find much, did they? No, there was a distinct smell of bleach and disinfectant all over everything, and it was pristine, like no one lived there. That was their words. It was pristine, as was his car, when they finally were able to get it up in, in New York. In New York. Tell the listeners a bite about uh, something that's in particularly interesting, uh, the missing bag, this kite sail bag, is that what it is called? A yes, sail he had, he, had, he had a kite sail, and the bags are about five and a half feet. That uh, a canvas bag that zippers up, about five and a half feet. Mm -hmm. And Kelly was about five two, five two and a half, five three. And I have been telling anyone that would listen, including in my blog, and I spoke with the police, that I believe that David Perry killed Kelly Rothwell by strangulation, and that he put her in the sail bag that held his sail put her in the back of his car, and that he drove to Elmira with her body. And I'm going to tell you why, Ed. I think that, and I think it in my gut, because he was a corrections officer, so he knew some bit about the law. He knew not to speak to anyone. He was a big camper. If he, even if he got stopped by someone, no one would look in the back of his trunk. No one would even think he could just say, oh, it's camping equipment, I'm, you know, I'm going back home, I'm in Florida, whatever. I don't think he ever thought he would get stopped, and I think he probably drove the speed limit the entire way. I think he took her, put her body in one of those sail bags because it would fit, and I think he took her up to New York because he knew the Pinellas County Sheriff's Office would never have the resources to go up there and look for her body. And Elmira and that area in Chemung County is vast, and he used to hunt up there and fish up there. The Chemung River is up there. The Seneca Lake is up there. That's the deepest lake. It's 623 feet deep. They need sonar to find things in that lake. Mm -hmm. um, and it's always been my assertion that that's what he did. Because if they, mm -hmm. he had left her anywhere in Florida, if he had tried to dump her in a swamp, the possibility of her being found was much higher than if she was up in New York where no one would think to look for her. And that has always been, and I still assert that, has always been my, my theory. Mm -hmm. I think it's a very good theory. I think it well, is. I think it is. I think things, in, in my research, um, I, like I said, I spoke to these guys, these, this one beach guy, the beach bum, and he said, you know, David always had his kite sail out, and he, and he explained to me about the bags, and then I called a sail shop a kite sail shop, and I got the information about the size of the bags and what, how they worked and were they zippered and, and that kind of thing. And I actually went and looked at one, and it would be very easy to put a body in one. Now, I'm a sailor. I used to have a sailboat, so I know what a sail bag can hold. And that is why it was my theory that that's what he did. I don't think he would have left her body in Florida. I think he took her with him and disposed of her up yeah. there. Yeah. Uh, I want to go back to uh, uh, something that you said because we're going to get into more, a little bit more about. It. I mean, we, we the, I think the listeners need to understand that David Perry just didn't turn out suddenly turn into a bad guy in 2008. We're going to get into that in a second. But you, uh, you mentioned 
that you believe that he killed her by strangulation. Tell us yeah. the reason you think this is because you tracked down his ex-wife. What can you tell uh, the listeners? And you've written this all on your blog, and I would urge everybody to check out um, Lee's blog regarding all of this. You taught you taught, you tracked down his ex-wife. What did she tell you? I tracked down his ex-wife, Luana, and again, I I did this blindly. I mean, I started making phone calls, and I went to the Google and the white pages for New York. I mean, I just started, and Elmira's not that big of a town. I literally started calling numbers out of the phone book. It was very strange. But I did get a hold of, on Facebook, a woman that had gone to school with David and knew Luana and them when they were married. I also ended up getting in touch with the police chief, who was then a patrolman, and he gave me some very stark information that he used to be called to Luana and David Perry's house all the time for domestic violence. And I got that information first. Mm -hmm. And then I said, well, I'm going to see if I can call his ex-wife and see if she'll speak with me. And it took me probably two or three weeks to track her down. But one of the things she said to me that I found most chilling was that David used to strangle her until she would almost pass out. And sometimes she would pass out. Totally. Mm -hmm. When he was mad, she said he had an extremely violent temper. He was very mean to the, her and her children. He was extremely physically abusive to her. And he told her that if he ever killed her, he could put her body where no one would find her. And he said that not once, but several times. Mm -hmm. Now, remember, he, he's 6'2 and a half, 6'3. Kelly was 5'3. So if he's strangulation to me seems to be his mode of what he does mm -hmm. when he's abusive and she would have been right at that height where he could have just grabbed her and just slammed her on the floor or whatever he did to her and i think that because there was no blood found at the scene at, at her apartment although it was pristinely cleaned i mean he there was disinfectant bleach and there were lines in the, in the rugs where he had vacuumed and that's what he liked to do he liked to make sure there were lines in the rug it was so OCD. It was just really scary. So we and, – and I remember when we had our first conversation about this a week ago or whenever it was that we had talked about that one of the other reasons that it could be that he brought the body back to New York, Kelly's body back to New York, is not just because of Pinellas County, but that's a very, very, very good reason, but also because maybe in the back of his mind he already had a place picked out from all those years earlier – when he was abusing his wife and he, he was very, he was very thinking possible. very possible okay well he also had told Luana that he would put her in, the, in a wood chipper and then he would dump the remains in the Chemung River <laughs> I mean these are things that he said to her on a day on an almost daily basis they were married almost 10 years but she said it was absolutely horrible from the get-go how long so, was he had been divorced before he met Kelly how many years um, I don't know because he was with another woman for 13 years, and she is the one he left for Kelly. Oh, okay. He literally came home and said, see ya. I don't want to be with you anymore. I met somebody else in, in Florida and packed his stuff up and drove back down to Florida. Oh, so he was married, then had some other girlfriend, and then met Kelly – uh, down here in Florida, and it should be noted for the record, we haven't even talked th about this yet, we don't even know what David was doing in Florida when he met Kelly. No, we do not. I have my suspicions, and I've posted mm. them on my blog. Mm -hmm. um, and again, these are theories, because I don't want to slander anyone. Yeah. Um, but I know that he was involved with several drug dealers up in New York. He made a lot of runs back and forth from Florida to New York. And in fact, Luana was actually the one that told me that she had been on a couple of the trips with him early on and that he was bringing pot, marijuana, mm -hmm. back and forth. And there was a story where somebody they went over to his house for some reason and they found marijuana plants in the basement yes they that was uh chief pete mckelko who was then a patrolman he's now he's now just retired last year i believe 
he was the chief of police for Elmira. Mm-hmm. Um, and he went over there. There was also a loaded gun on top of the refrigerator. And uh, they went over for a domestic call. And David, of course, smoothed everything over. There was never any charges filed. And anything else that was filed would be uh, would not be accessible because in New York, in that area, everything's tied to Division of Children and Family Services. So those records are sealed unless there's a, a law FOIA. So you have to, I wasn't able to get any of the information on that. So okay. I couldn't get any information on any of the reports, the police reports, because they're sealed. For some reason, that's how they do it up there in that area. Mm-hmm. So I tried to get I tried to get some information that was giving me a little more background, but I just I couldn't find it. I tried. Hey, uh, uh, anybody? <laughs> hey, trust me, Lee. Anybody who's going to go to your blog, once again, it's called the Tampa Bay Crime Report dot com. You're they're yeah, going to know. They're going right. they're yeah. going to know. They're going to know. So we've right. set up so far so far we've set up the kind of relationship that David Perry had with Kelly. We have – yes, we had the, the relationship that he had with his ex-wife uh, that was volatile. Were you ever able to track down the girlfriend that he had before Kelly? I don't remember. Uh, no, and I actually tried to do that yesterday. I have, hmm. I'm still on this case. I know I'm you are. I know you are. And it's interesting. I want, your, I want your listeners to understand that this is something that I take very seriously and – um, I have decided, as I said, when I promised Nancy that I would bring her daughter home, that I was going to stay on this case until we came to a conclusion. Yeah. So I was still trying, as of yesterday, uh, to contact someone who had her sister as a friend on Facebook. And I'm waiting to hear back to see if anyone will get back with me. I think eventually I did get a hold of her dad. This woman was living with her dad. I'm not going to use her name because mm-hmm. I don't want to, you know. Okay. Um, you don't have to. I mean, it's you don't have to. Yeah, I don't have to use her name, but I. But she is uh, apparently afraid of him. She was afraid of him then, but she was with him for a long time. And I don't know why. Um, I don't know how she stayed with him. I don't know if their relationship was different than his relationship with Luana. Um, I don't. I don't know. But I can't imagine that he would be much different with another woman. Because I spoke to several girls that dated him in high school and said all, everyone to a person said how volatile he was, how angry, how quick he was to anger. He had a, a quick temper. Um, I mean, he almost choked out a cook at Outback Steakhouse for cooking his food wrong. So he's, choking mm. seems to be his, his big thing. That's his go-to, I think. And that's still why I think he choked, choked Kelly. Yeah. I think that's how he killed her. So we have so. Kelly. We have, the, we have the ex-wife. We still haven't yet talked about the woman that he went to after this happened, when he went back to New York, what can you tell the listeners about this? Because this is also very fascinating, having to do with Hawaii. And this is, I guess, to kind of foreshadow, this is kind of when you and David started, he started finding out about you. Yes. Okay. He, so let's, let's yes. talk about that now. Okay. What I found out was, uh, one of the things we found out was that he had gone in two weeks prior to Kelly going missing, presumed murdered in my head, that he was leaving for Hawaii, and he canceled his, his gym membership. Now, the gym uh, director was was interviewed by the police and verified all this, that he went in two weeks prior to Kelly going missing. So he was already planning on going to Hawaii. A woman named Melissa Marie Walker was a National Guards person, guardsman in Las Vegas. David had gone across country to visit her. Apparently, he told everyone and she told everyone they met two weeks after Kelly went missing. And they met on Craigslist, supposedly. Doesn't jive. Doesn't jive at all because he had gone in and canceled his his gym membership and said he was moving, moving to Hawaii. Now, coincidentally, I find out that Melissa Walker was about to be deployed to Tripler Army Medical Center in Hawaii. Wow. And this was something I found out from digging, and I thought that was extremely interesting. You must have – when you – I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall when you discovered that. I bought you about fell over when you discovered that. Well, I, 
I, I had an idea. I had an idea that he had that he had something else going on. He seems to me to be, have a pattern. He's always got something next coming, always looking forward, always got something else working. So I think he had already decided. I, I think that Kelly was aware, and this goes back to, we didn't really touch on that, but during mm-hmm. the time that Kelly was with him, Kelly told her sister Lindsay, and all she would say was that he was into something bad, and she asked him to stop, and he promised he would. And that's all Lindsay could get out of out of Kelly. Kelly was very quiet and very secretive. She wasn't. She just kept to herself, and she didn't really tell her family about what Dave was doing. Mm-hmm. I think she might have been embarrassed. She was kind of private. Um, but that having said that, I still think that once she decided to go into law enforcement, I think that she was a threat to whatever he was doing. And my latest blog post was about what did she know about his business. Um, and I feel that he had this plan. And I'm going to tell you why. Mm-hmm. Because he, shortly after, two weeks after Kelly went missing, this is after Kelly went missing, he started, and I can use this in quotation marks, seeing Melissa Walker. He had been already emailing her and, and, and talking with her prior to that, and he lied about that. Mm-hmm. They have his phone records. Um, I think he was setting that up. And when he he also had scheduled a moving company to come and paid six thousand dollars to pick up his stuff at the condo. This was prior it, he called them prior to Kelly going missing. So there's a lot of weird little clues that show that this was premeditated. And there's and, and, I, and, and all the research that you've done talking to her friend Donna, talking to the parents, talking to the cadets that she went to school with, not one of them said you know what? I think David's moving out. No, not one of them said that. I don't think he he made no indication. He didn't tell Kelly he was moving mm-hmm. because I I no he didn't say like oh yeah I'm going to move whatever I I found someone else. No, there mm-hmm. was nothing like that. Okay. It was fact it was she that was going to be breaking up with him. She was the one that was going to be, um, giving him saying you know I think we're done. This is something, and she was trying to do it gently. She was afraid of hurting his feelings which I find, yeah. you know, remarkable on her part and gentle on her part, but just not the right thing because she was trying to spare him and she was sparing a monster's feelings with what she was doing, and I don't think she knew it. Yeah. I'm sure she didn't know it, or she would never have gone back into that house alone. Donna had offered to go with her, and Donna was very upset that she did not. She didn't insist. You know, Kelly had said, no, I'll be fine, no problem. We're going to have a good conversation. She kept saying, good conversation. So hmm. this whole indication that David had already had something going on with Melissa Walker, um, there's a lot of evidence that points to that. But Melissa Walker, when the police interviewed her, first of all, she didn't want to talk to them. And she said that she met David after. She tried to conclude, concur with his story that they met after Kelly went missing. But really, the love of your life of three years, and you find someone two weeks after that, and all of a sudden now you're, you know, he went out to Colorado and visit, I mean, out to Las Vegas and visit her. They had a photograph of the two of them standing on the side of a mountain together. And I'm, I do want to let your listeners know that coincidentally, she looks a lot like Kelly, which is very scary and odd. Um, she has the same facial features, the same height. Uh, it was very strange to see this photograph that was posted. Hmm. I've not I've not seen a picture of her, but um, I don't. Maybe I have, and I just don't. I know I've got. You have it on your blog. Maybe I just forget that I saw it. I did. I've I not do. seen it. I do. Okay. I do. Then the so, listeners will find it there. Great. Good. Yes. Good. Uh, what was he doing in Las Vegas? Obviously, Kelly didn't go with him out there. What was he doing there? You, do you know? I don't know what his excuse was to go there, but I know he was visiting her because I ended up talking to her sister who confirmed that. And um, he was out there. Apparently he visited twice. And I don't know that Kelly knew it. I don't know if if Kelly, if he said he was going back to New York. I don't know what he said to her. Unfortunately, I don't know any of that information. I don't know if there's any way to get it. Okay. Um, Believe me, I've tried. I've I've called. I've asked the people. But I did speak to her sister. And um, she confirmed that he did go out there twice. He met her parents. And... 
the whole nine yards. Her sister lives in New Orleans. So. Okay. Now, what you did next was interesting to me, is when you found out that she was going to Hawaii and that he might be going to Hawaii with her, you called Hawaii. <laughs> did you? I didn't just call Hawaii. <laughs> At four in the morning, I called, I got the number for the Tripler Army Medical Center, and I called and got the captain or the, I can't, I don't remember what rank he was. The, top, mm, the, top the base guy, commander, let's say. The base commander, let's commander. say. I believe he was the commander. I mm. believe whoever it was. And there was and there was no answer. So I left a message and I said, you know, sir, this is Lee Clifton, blah, blah, blah. I believe that if you have a, an employee of yours there, she had already moved. I said, I believe you have an employee there who probably has security clearance. And I want you to know that she's going to be marrying a person who's a murder suspect in a case here in Florida. Would you please call me back? <laughs> and that concludes part one of my interview with Lee Clifton concerning the disappearance of Kelly Rothwell. You can find part two of this interview at Potomatic or iTunes. I'll leave the rest of the theorizing up to you. And that's the program. If you found it informative, please go to the app that you use to listen to Unfound and give this podcast a nice review. I thank you for listening. I'm Ed Denzel, and you've been listening to Unfound.